Greetings, uh, everyone, um, or as we say in the tradition, praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Elder Eric Williams, and I am assistant to the coordinator of the Koji Scholars Fellowship. Uh, vocationally, I serve as a curator of religion for the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. And I also teach in the School of Theology at the Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, today, it is my delight to uh, moderate a conversation um, and an exchange uh, of uh, some of the uh, theological educators within uh, the denomination around a, a very exciting uh, text that has been recently released, uh, which is edited by Dr. Alonzo Johnson, who will be joining us momentarily, uh, The Church of God in Christ Ordination and Licensure Textbook. Uh, today, we will hear from uh, four of the authors, um, and they will talk about their contributions to the text and the usefulness of the text uh, for training and preparation uh, for ordained ministry. And while the Church of God in Christ does not have a, uh, uh, an official uh, a text that is required for ordination, um, today we want to talk about the usefulness of this text uh, for training for all ministry workers and especially uh, those who are being called to the ordained ministry. Um, to do this, we have with us today uh, uh, the Bishop David Allen Hall, who is uh, a general board member and the, uh, the chair of the board of Mason Theological Seminary and pastor of Temple Church of God in Christ in Memphis, Tennessee. Welcome, uh, Bishop Hall. Dr. Williams, good evening. How are you doing, sir? Doing very well. Great to great to be with you and to have you here with us today. Um, Thank you. We also have with us Dr. Goldie Wales, who joins us from the city of Goldsboro. I'm, I'm sorry, Greensboro, North Carolina, and that Wales Memorial Church of God in Christ. Uh, Dr. Wales is one of the instructors uh, for the Jurisdictional Academy of uh, uh, Greater North Carolina jurisdiction, and she is a contributor uh, to this volume. And so we bless the Lord for Dr. Wells. God bless you, Dr. Wells, and great to have you with us today. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, we also have with us today uh, the dean of our seminary in the person of Dr. Harold Bennett. Dr. Bennett is uh, the, the Dean of the Mason, Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary in Atlanta, and he is uh, the uh, administrative assistant to the pastor of the Temple of Faith Church of God in Christ in the greater Atlanta metropolitan area. So thank you, uh, Dean Bennett, for hosting this event, and we're glad to have you, and we look forward to your contributions th uh, today. Well, th thank you so much, Dr. Williams, and Bishop Hall and the whole committee for being a part of this work. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. And last but not least, uh, uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Alonzo Johnson, who is the pastor of that great church in Irmo, South Carolina, the Universal Outreach Church of God in Christ. And Dr. Johnson is, is also a professor of theology at the uh, seminary of Allen University in Columbia, South Carolina. And Dr. Johnson, as I mentioned earlier, is the editor of this volume that we will discuss today. And so we're grateful to have you with us, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, uh, Dr. Williams, and to uh, my colleagues on this panel. It is a delight to uh, be here with you all today, and I too look forward to our engagement of the text and of each other surrounding it. Wonderful. Well, how we will proceed today, uh, we will have a couple of rounds of questions, and then we will um, uh, allow some time for exchange between the contributors. And um, the, our first uh, panelist that will uh, speak to us today 
is uh, Bishop David Hall. Bishop Hall, uh, yes, can, you, can you share how your chapter prepares people for leadership in the Church of God in Christ, especially those preparing for ordination? Thank you, Dr. Williams. And to all of my colleagues, I am just immensely proud of the fact that uh, we have now the standardized ordination curriculum and licensure materials. Uh, it was some years ago that Dr. Bennett and I were sitting in his office at Theological Seminary, Mason Theological Seminary, by the way, talking about the fact that we needed to get some standardized approach to uh, the preparation of ministers and certified women for uh, our ordination and certification processes. We began to then uh, talk about the subject matters that would be needed to produce such a volume. And it was from there that uh, that began our genesis, this journey to creating this wonderful and outstanding text. I'm glad to say that uh, it has been utilized across the country and now we are now introducing it by means of this uh, video to whosoever will be uh, using it. I'm glad to say that I took care of the polity section of the book. Church polity, how one governs itself, the structure of the church, how that governance and protocols work to create, if you will, uh, 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 those things that we guide ourselves by in principle that we are an Episcopal church in principle that we have a setup that is a tremendous blend that uh, demonstrates the heritage and the rich cultivation of our organization from various and sundry other disciplines or reformations. Because when Bishop Mason came to the knowledge that God wanted him to take this route, he used no doubt many aspects of his faith he was a Baptist. He will be belong to some holiness groups and federations, etc. But one thing he was acutely aware of was that God was calling him to make a unique institution that was sanctification oriented and uh, and eventually Pentecostal. The church structure, the church structure is what polity is about. We are, if you will, an Episcopal church, but because of the way that our church in its genesis was formed, uh, the Episcopal setting came in time. There were no bishops when Bishop Mason established the church. Its hierarchy was more loosely connected. And he was uh, 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 the progenitor. He had unlimited power. He made and gave appointments and set directions and standards and policies he did it all himself, and with those who collaborated with him, his word was final. In many cases, it was the first and the last word. But as time would have it, our denomination took shape. And so therefore, we have added to what Bishop Mason began, a plethora of organizational lines. We have great integrity in that uh, we have a general assembly in our church which has its Presbyterian elements. We have uh, a congregationist element in that most of our congregations derive from an independent uh, 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 beginning, uh, ma and pop. Someone was urged by God to open up a door, began preaching. And it was that with that alignment with the church of God in Christ that many of our early persons, such as my grandfather, began to understand that Yes, he was the leader of the church, but uh, he had to be ordained. And so he was ordained by Bishop Mason. And he became pastor, yes, but an elder. And under him, he placed ministers. And soon it became unlicensed and licensed ministers. And then as time went on, they developed superintendents and then overseers, which later became bishops. Church structure grew in that sense in our church. And I'm glad that it went that way because it, it suggested who we are, were more than, more than if we were a knockoff or trying to replicate somebody else. It had its own natural way of flowing and financing and uh, 
building mission orientation and directions, etc. So polity, polity gives us the church's structure. It gives us the church's method of operation. It lets us know that our church now presently has three branches which are consistent to this. We have a judiciary board, we have a general assembly, and we have an executive board, which is called the general board. These three branches represent government. A lot of people would equate that structure to that of the United States government, but uh, it's vastly different. And really there is little parallel. For instance, the president of the United States heads the executive branch of government for America. In the Church of God in Christ, it is a 12-man board. And it is an elected board on quadrennial. And from the 12 that is elected, one is elected presiding bishop, who will guide the church in principle whenever the General Assembly of the church is not in session. Candidates for ministry, for ministry, and for credential need to understand that the General Assembly, which is the delegate and voted constituents of the church elected for assembly meetings meet twice a year, as our polity would say. And whatever the general board, the executive branch of the church does, it must be approved by the general assembly. So I'm giving you structure and telling you how it works. And if, and if we were in a class of those preparing for ministry, they would understand that uh, the general board takes care of the church. It executes the policies, procedures. It guides the church and everything while the General Assembly is not in session. But when the General Assembly, by constitution, comes to session only twice a year, and with the exception of a special meeting, they then approve whatever the general board undertook and did. Then there is the judiciary branch, which is conceived of nine persons. And they take care of all of those things, which as a tribunal and court system would do. Now, you understand that the difference is this, is that our Supreme Court is not like our judiciary because Supreme Court in America is there for a lifetime appointment. Our General Assembly, it's made up of delegates and year to year, the jurisdictional assemblies, which every jurisdiction has, must approve that delegation to be sent to the national meeting. So you see, so if, if I began to just bring it all down, you would say, wow, those are differences. They, it may appear to be that there is a tripartite system of governance, but cannot be uh, uh, equated to, neither is it equivalent to that of the United States government. We are a church organization. We are ecclesium. We are a church. And we are a unique blend of all three of those disciplines, Congregationalist and the Presbyterian, obviously. And then we then have an Episcopal set up because our church is governed and led by our bishops. Now, I could go on and, and say more about polity, but, but polity gives you that sense of how you are to operate and to function. It helps you to understand who has charge, who can and who will lead at different times in different aspects. And then our church, in terms of our polity, has a board of trustees, even though the general board is the director of the, the holds the directorship of the church in its hands. And principally, in the secular and civil world, that 12-man board is, of course, the director, body of directors for the church. We have a general assembly, yes, but that general board directs the church. And also we have another person that is very important to the hierarchy of the church, that is the general secretary of our church. And the general secretary has his tentacles reaching all the way down to the local churches because it is through his office that the licensure of our people and that the certification of those voting delegates, etc., that is maintained. And through our system, we have something that is unique to ourselves 
and that every person that is an ordained clergy, a credentialed woman, must understand, must participate in. And that's what this standardized ordination material does. It gives the individual that wants to be legitimately, as we say, kojic, the wherewithal to operate, to understand, and to deal with how we govern ourselves and join in the governance of our church at either local, district, jurisdiction, national, and also international level. You see, we are a worldwide organization. And I'll say this and then I'll bring my remarks to close so that someone else can come on with the part of the discipline that they that they share. It was my pleasure to, to, to write the polity section and through research analysis and through discussion to try to nuance it and to bring it into sharp focus so that we know who we are, how we are, and what we're doing, and that it is properly the Church of God in Christ's way. So, Dr. Williams, if you will let me stop right there. I uh, I think someone else wants to have something to say, but I want I want to pay homage to 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 all of those who have have found this material to be great, and I want to encourage its use everywhere. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop. Um, thank you. Uh, now we're going to hear from Dr. Goldie Wells. Dr. Wells. I'm pleased to be a part of this discussion today. And uh, the section of the book that the text that I was a privilege to contribute to is called The Call of, of the Morning Women, The Church of God in Christ, Legacy of Women in the Ministry. I'm so pleased that this chapter was included because women pay, play a major role in the Church of God in Christ. From the early days of our father, founding fathers and our founding mothers, the women have been strong support. I'm pleased that the men of the church who will be seeking ordination will have a chance to know more about the women's department and its importance to their local assemblies. This chapter is, is essential to anyone who is seeking of the, for women that's seeking to be uh, licensed or a male who's seeking ordination in the Church of God in Christ. The chapter is authored by Dr. Adrian Israel and me. And it has important information about the role of women and the biblical and historical foundations on which the Church of God in Christ has based the policies and practices that determine the role of women in ministry to fulfill the Great Commission. The chapter is divided into four separate overlapping forces that help to shape the ministry of women in the Church of God in Christ. First, the African-American history, culture, and religion. Secondly, the impact of women in the holiness Pentecostal revival. Third, the Church of God in Christ founder, Bishop Charles Harrison Mason's determination to forge a place for women in the church that's consistent with biblical doctrine. And fourth, the principles and practices of the church that are articulated in its articles of religion and our constitution. Because the Church of God in Christ was independently organized by African-Americans who were not withdrawing or separating from a white affiliated group. The Church of God in Christ founding fathers were able to freely determine its approach to gender relations. At the end of the 19th and the early beginning of the 20th century, out of the worldwide holiness Pentecostal revival, the Church of God in Christ emerged as a classical Pentecostal body in 1907. As a result, the Church of God in Christ shares the heritage of other holiness and Pentecostal churches and an African-American cultural heritage that encouraged women to freely exercise their spiritual gifts. Although men and women have worked together, their roles have often 
been different. The Church of God in Christ bases its uh, doctrine and practices on biblical interpretation that recognizes the spiritual equality of men and women while preserving the biblical mandate of male oversight of the church. So in this chapter, we discuss the relationship between men and women by exploring the scriptural and historical roots. By studying this chapter, students should understand the purpose, the structure, the function, and the ministries of the Church of God in Christ's women's department and fully grasp how the women's department and women's ministries have changed over time. In addition, they should understand why the Church of God in Christ allows local churches flexibility to shape their women's departments and provide opportunities for women to exercise their spiritual and temporal gifts. In this chapter, we explore the origin of women's work in the Church of God in Christ by ex examining the role of women in the Old and New Testaments and addressing the writings of the apostles. It continues with the review of African-American religious heritage and the early preaching women who participated in holiness and Pentecostal revivals. It then examines the foundational auxiliaries and includes biographical sketches of the leaders of the women's department and other key women leaders in the Church of God in Christ. The focus then shifts to the women who helped to establish the women's department and those who made other valuable contributions to the growth of the Church of God in Christ. The, the, the chapter uh, concludes with an analysis of current events and their biblical implications for women today with observations from the changing roles of women in the Church of God in Christ and prospects for the future of women in the Church of God in Christ. I, I would say that this, this chapter is essential to any male or female who wants to become a credential holder in the Church of God in Christ. But the, the information in this text is so valuable that lay people can learn so much about the Church of God in Christ, especially in this, in this chapter, about the women's ministry and all of the, the contributors today all of us have put time and effort in but it this is a valuable document that it and all of us should have on our shelves thank you so much um, dr wells uh, for that wonderful overview um, at this time we're um, going to hear from our dean in the person of dr hero bennett as he comes to talk to us about his contribution. Dr. Bennett. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams and, and, and colleagues. The piece that I wrote uh, in this uh, organized and licen licensure textbook, I wrote about the, the Old Testament. And as I drafted this piece, and as I think about the question that we are uh, exploring how my particular chapter will help prepare men and women for leadership and for a ministry in the Church of God in Christ and elsewhere in the world. I'd like for us to consider that uh, this chapter will do uh, several things. On the one hand, uh, what this chapter will do, it will introduce our, our community or, or even uh, find ways to help our community understand more about this, this, this document that our manual says in our articles of religion, it talks about the Bible and it says that our, our Bible is the final court of appeal in matters of controversy between believers, between, between saints in particular. And so what this piece will, will, will do um, that I'm writing, it's going to help uh, that I have written actually, this chapter will help the student 
will help the reader, will help the, the, the scholar, the missionary, the preacher, the evangelist. It's going to expose him or her more so to the, the structure of the Old Testament, the, the contents of the Old Testament, themes in the Old Testament, issues of ethics in the Old Testament, uh, salient events in the history of, of ancient Israel. Uh, those kinds of things are some of the things that it, that it will do. For example, as it starts talking about the structure of the Old Testament, clearly it's going to talk about the different components that comprise the Old, the Old Testament. And what will happen in the chapter, you'll see a, a couple of things talked about there uh, where you're, you're looking at Genesis, you look at Exodus, Leviticus, and then you're looking at uh, the prophetic books and you're looking at the books of poetry. You're looking at how they can, uh, ways that they can be grouped and you're looking at essentially how and where they actually fall in into place in the, in the Old Testament itself, how in fact it is structured. That's that's a very important piece. And you can actually, as you look at it and you look at how it's organized, how it's arranged, that will kind of help the reader kind of be able to start doing some things in terms of tracing words and themes and, and those kinds of things. So it, it will definitely, this chapter that I wrote, will help the, the reader, the scholar, the thinker become more familiarized with the, with the structure of the First Testament of the the Old Testament. Very important because in our church, we believe the Bible is very, very important. The Bible is critical to our to our faith and to our spiritual formation. The chapter that I wrote will help men and women prepare for leadership and ministry in our church because again, it's going to help the, 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 the reader become more familiar with the con with the content, the content, not just the structure, but the content, what in fact is in the Old Testament. When you're looking at Genesis, looking at, you know, the, the beginnings of the world, the, 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 the text that it talks about Adam and Eve and the fall and, and genealogies and languages and how diversity of speech came about and the Exodus and, and Moses and the giving of the law and, and the entering of the land and looking at how we talk about the monarchy and where it comes from and the, the prophetic movement and looking at some of the things that, that are happening there in the book of Isaiah and and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and looking at what the Psalms are saying. What are they, what, 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 what's, what's there? The content, the content. It's going to help our, our, our readers gain more familiarity with the, with the, with the content and, and closely connected to this conversation about the, the, the content, you know, the key ideas. Um, persons who are reading this will learn about many of the themes that are there in the Old Testament. The notion about creation, the whole idea about love, idea about holiness, you know, the big term mishpat, justice, tzidika, righteousness, you know, a lot of themes that are very, very important for understanding the, the Old Testament and even for appreciating what's going to happen in the New Testament. The, the, the chapter that I wrote that we have here for our for persons who are going to read the, the ordination and licensure textbook will will expose more of more of these themes, which is so, so important and connected to the, the question about about content. Remember, remember, our manual talks about how important the Bible is. It's foundational when we're trying to get at issues of right and wrong. Our our articles of religion say it's the final court of appeal. And so this chapter that I wrote will help men and women because, again, it's going to introduce questions about, help us to resolve issues about ethics, about ethics, the whole question of being and thinking. Uh, what does it mean to, to do certain things? How, how do we talk about right and wrong? There are, this chapter will help the reader, you know, look at and, and identify characters, identify text, identify issues that can prove very, very helpful when it comes to trying to decide some of the complexing moral issues uh, that we're dealing with even on the scene today. So, you know, with, with issues of structure, issues of context, particular themes are in the Old Testament, issues of ethics, all of these 
Well, well, you get you, you learn more about the Old Testament definitely by looking at this chapter. But there's something else I want to tell you about this chapter. This chapter also will introduce the the reader to key events in the history of ancient Israel, which is so important for understanding the Old Testament. We'll talk about the, the ancestral period, the period of the matriarchs and the, the patriarchs. We'll talk about the Exodus and we'll talk about the Confederacy. We'll talk about the whole period of the, the monarchy and we'll talk about Israel when it, when, when it fissions, when it splits. We'll talk about the exile. We'll talk about what happens when they return and start rebuilding the community when the second commonwealth shows up. So what will happen when the when the, when the scholar reads this book, when the preacher reads it, when the missionary reads it, when the evangelist reads it, whoever reads it, it's going to help him or her because she or he is going to learn about major epochs, major periods in the in the history of ancient Israel. All of this stuff that's embedded in the in the first in the first testament. That's so so important. It's going to help us because again. It's going to help the thinker uh, get, a, get a basis for being able to read other scholarly books and other materials that have been written that will help make some sense out of uh, that, that that's being talked about and that's being discussed. This is a great this, this this is a great book. This is a great project that 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 the presiding bishop and church guiding Christ has has allowed us to to to, to produce, and I'm I'm very very confident that the chapters that each of us have written is going to be real, real good. The Old Testament one, though, I'm hoping that it will add something to our body of knowledge on, about that first testament, Old Testament term that will show up in their Hebrew Bible. You know, that that term, all of these terms are so important for what it is we, in fact, will be doing. So, again, Dr. Williams, to respond to your, your question, how in the world would this chapter on the Old Testament Kind of help men and women prepare for ministry, prepare for leadership. I, I I'm just convinced that I'm that it will add something to their their spiritual formation, something to their growth uh, as they learn something about the structure, the contents, themes, ethics, all of those uh, items that will help make some sense out of uh, the Old Testament. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very thoughtful and comprehensive overview. Um, at this time, we're going to hear from the editor in the person of Dr. Alonzo Johnson. So Dr. Johnson is coming and we'll hear from him. Thank you, uh, Dr. Williams, and to my colleagues on this uh, precious Lord's Day. Wow, where do I begin to talk about uh, my contribution? It is a privilege to have uh, served as the general editor and uh, contributing uh, author for uh, this very uh, significant uh, text in the history of the church that we all love, um, taking over that assignment from uh, Bishop Hall, who shepherded it through the earliest stages of uh, this work, um, um, the earlier volumes, I should say, and uh, then climaxing with what we did in um, the production of this current volume with its given imperfection. Um, being involved with this for me was uh, both personal um, because I saw it as a outgrowth of the contributions that uh, my late mentor, um, the Bishop Ithiel Conrad Clemens once said to me that there would come a time, and these were his words, that the church would have to look for you guys. And by you guys, he was talking about the young men and women uh, that he had mentored, those of us in various areas of the life of the church, uh, but also all academicians who do what we do um, as uh, scholars, biblical scholars, theologians, ethicists, um, practical uh, theologians, historians, et cetera. Um, and, and so this particular volume brings us to this place to make what we hope is a contribution that will be good for the life of the church. What this volume isn't, 
uh, let me stop by saying that. What it isn't, it isn't um, a volume that answers all questions that um, is something that you should try to sit down and read. It's not a novel. <laughs> You're not gonna try to sit down and read this in a night or two. This volume is written from the backdrop that we believe reflects the fact that as a person in ministry, you are in a lifelong vocation. You know, some of us retire uh, from the pastorate, retire from the bishopric, retire from being supervisor, etc. But when you get this calling, it goes with you to the grave. So what we thought was that we would put this together in such a way that it could be something that an individual studying uh, um, on his or her own, a jurisdiction, a pastor, a superintendent, bishops, people, uh, supervisors who are looking for uh, credentialing materials could take this and be something that could help to guide or more appropriately be the foundation for lifelong learning and particularly for at least three years or so of licentiate. Uh, status, where a person is uh, at the foundational levels of uh, being called into ministry, licensed, etc., uh, or working this out um, in the licensing processes for our women's department, that, that the manual then could uh, allow you to go through those critical areas of learning, of knowledge, practical, spiritual, biblical, theological history, uh, organizational that that would help you to be proficient as an elder, as a leader in the church. So you know, we're not encouraging you to start at the beginning and read until the end. The, the, the reality is that since the most important part of you, the most important part of who you are as a called person, the most significant thing that you will ever have to do is be your own pastor, be your own leader be your own shepherd so i encourage you to look at that practical section the book is divided into eight sections and that practical uh section uh uh talks about studying uh, to know yourself to know yourself studying to show yourself approved knowing yourself and showing yourself approved practical spiritual discipline what kind of spiritual discipline, habits, uh, behavior, uh, devotional habits. Uh, what kind of habits, what kind of disciplines do we need to have in order to be lifelong, uh, effective rather, over the period of a lifelong as a clergy person? So how to be your own pastor, your own shepherd. So spiritual formation, which is what Bishop uh, Sam Hogan talks about, essentials of effective ministry, spiritual growth. How do I keep myself on a pathway since I might start at this in my as I did as an 18 year old and now I'm 65 and this might be a journey of a lifetime or it should be how do I keep this fresh keep it moving keep it challenging so that there is never a day that I do this I walk this walk that I'm not personally existentially, as we say, in the guild, or, or at, at my deepest level, I'm not challenged, I'm not moved, almost to the point of tears about the awesomeness, the finality of this call and this journey that I'm on and have the privilege of being able to share with people of faith my own family and others that the Lord would connect to me in ministry. So if you start there, dealing with who you are as a person, your personal foundation and, and, and get your disciplines right because the, the theology doesn't matter if your disciplines are, are out of whack or jacked up. The, the, the history doesn't matter if for you it's only a, a matter of something that you do to perform a job rather than being something that reflects who you are at your core. So how to navigate the waters personally is the most important thing for me in this text. 
And then you go to look at what's essential in terms of understanding who we are as a Kojic church. So in that first section, you know, understanding your calling as an elder, you know, the elders calling, uh, uh, understanding and overviewing the purpose of, of ordination, the, the role of an elder um, and the functions of an elder as um, talked about by Bishop, the late Bishop William Watson, the biblical uh, subjects, Old and New Testament that Dr. Bennett's just talked about. We've come this far by faith. And Bishop Daniels, who's in the background with us today, but the history part, you know, getting at that, that's section three. Section four, um, the faith once delivered to the saints. One of the biggest, <laughs> you want to get into a debate, <laughs> talk about, well, that clause. I know <laughs> the clause we, uh, that deals with uh, how we are to understand our doctrine and what is it about or what is it in our doctrine that we cannot change. So there is a, a significant section on the critical pieces related to the development of Kojic doctrine, providing a framework. Our job here is not to not to develop doctrine as in we are writing a doctrine for the church, but to provide a framework or frameworks within which you can understand, interpret, and talk critically, I might say, without apology, as well as um, um, accurately talking about the key elements of our faith, whether it's the articles of religion, how those articles develop, and again, frameworks for which and with it within which to understand it, how they were understood early on by Bishop Mason and emerge over time, uh, early Kojic uh, doctrines uh, um, and the statement of faith and um, general theological knowledge. All of those areas we provide a framework for helping you to discuss and apply to every aspect of our faith. And, and when you get at that, you're getting at everything that is essential as far as the doctrinal stuff in the manual um, and the Kojic manual, which you need, of course, to study side by side, the black book with this. All right, I'm, uh, uh, so I ramble on. There was a practical section to it that has some very practical things. There are some sections on preaching and counseling, excellent sections on counseling, evangelism, excellent sessions on, on how do we talk about counseling in this day and time, in the 21st century, principles for preaching evangelism. Oh, I could go on and on for an hour. <laughs> I'll stop there because I, I suppose I'll have an opportunity to come back and share some more. What a wonderful uh, time we're having today as we uh, discuss this very important text, uh, the Church of God in Christ ordination, ordination and Licensure textbook. And at this time, I'm going to invite uh, the panelists to join me. Uh, on the, the screen as we explore together this question uh, from each of your perspectives. Uh, how can this book be a game changer for preparing people for ordination within our denomination? In no particular order, I invite you to uh, uh, talk from your perspective uh, how you understand this book as uh, having the potential to be a game changer. Uh, for preparing people for ministry. Dr. Will? Um, I uh, could see this being a major game change, uh, changer. Uh, when we look at the fact that we are a spirit-led church, if someone says that the Lord has called them into the ministry for years, uh, that was that's all necessary. If the pastor says, Yes, I believe you've been called. And then that was almost just a, a way, a passage to get to the ordination board and with the missionaries to get to the examining board. Uh, I can see this as being a way when someone has read and learned from their reading to be more informed when they go to the ordination board or to the licensing board, because the, the things that you've heard from us today 
there there's so much packed into these pages and anyone who increases their knowledge will have more a more influence i think this is a different day we have congregations that are filled with many um folks who are educated and just talk here and dr bennett talk about knowing the things in the old testament and simple mistakes wouldn't be made you know someone saying the 150 division of psalms you know, those little things like that uh when you read and learn more then it it makes a difference so i can see it being a, a major game changer when it comes to the ministers and missionaries that become credential holders and even to lay sunday school teachers ypww teachers learning how the church operates and, and that polity is so important so that they would know the structure of the church and these chapters that have been written he just gave little highlights of of what's in the volume but you can just choose something that you want to know more about and read that section and gain knowledge so i just see it being a major game changer so i'm hoping that more people will read and use this text because it will make a big difference thank you thank you dr others well i will say this piece will be a major game changer in and it's especially when it comes to um helping individuals uh, be able to talk about the, the Bible. I just love talking about the Bible. Looking at the Bible and having some feel for what life was like in, in, in ancient Israel, knowing what life was like in the ancient world, knowing the types of issues with which the people struggle, because what that does, it positions the preacher, the missionary, the teacher. It positions him or her to be able to make a logical connect between some of the things that we're dealing with now and what was happening in the in the biblical community? It's a game changer because when you're reading this 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 document, and I'm I'm just so thankful to uh, to Dr. Johnson for going back, putting a lot of the the, the finishing touches on it to make it even more readable. The, the, what has happened is going to it's going to be an easier entry into finding ways to even with, with with the Old Testament piece in particular to understand Jesus, to understand Paul to understand many of the issues with which the early church was, was, was dealing with. It's a game changer because, again, it's going to position our missionaries, our preachers, uh, everybody who's reading these, these, this, this material to, to be at a point where they're, they're preaching, and Do Dr. Wells pointed this out, their preaching can be better, their teaching can be, can be better. In fact, it will even assist and if they're involved in the jurisdictional institutes, um, the information is here. It'll be a game changer. It's almost like a little prep course to help them perhaps prepare for other classes in Bible college, maybe even clearing space for them to consider uh, making the trek to Mason Theological Seminary. There's a lot of good stuff in here that's going to help the, the, the careful reader to distinguish him or herself from the community of the saints that we're going to be serving because of the the detail of the of the of the, the, the discussions that are here and the, and the way that the readability because that's the other term i will use so what will happen then it will position the person to 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 have some good content to teach some good content to preach uh, a really good understanding for being able to explain you know what in fact is in the text uh, what is in the Bible. And in that sense, I think it's going to position the person to do the missionary, the evangelist, to really speak from an informed perspective. And as uh, it's been said earlier, Dr. Wells in particular, talking about giving some credibility, some, some credibility. Uh, Dr. Johnson mentioned it, so mentioned it too. So I, I just think that's what, a, what, what it's going to do. It's going to really help our men and women, uh, as I would say, really command more respect from the people that we're sharing because our church has um, made an effort to give us some tools to work with. 
Wonderful. Uh, Bishop Hall. The Church of God in Christ is a worldwide institution, and the collaboration that we bring to the table uh, from the various corners of the country, if not the world, provide a really strong presentation of who we are. In a day and time as dynamic as it is in the world today, with so many uh, pseudo doctrines, where that the world sometimes seems to be turned upside down, we have to purvey a cogicity, a cogicness in terms of our doctrine, our ministry. We have to project an ethos that is thoroughly Pentecostal, vetted, tested, and prepared to face whatever the world is throwing at us. This material gives our people that opportunity, even a fighting chance to make great strides and to impact the world at large, at every level. So this is going to bring us a, a, a greater ability to contest for souls, for positions in society as purveyors of truth, uh, people who are on the, on the cutting edge, making life more suitable and livable, spiritual in every way. And so this document, which uh, obviously has been vetted and tested in over a hundred of our jurisdictions uh, is now ready and available. And then I'll say it this way in close, that we have other parts to this program that uh, are exciting, such as our Book of the Month Club, where there will be an eclectic approach to uh, giving resource materials that will augment the development of our credentialed workers and our ordained clergy to approach life, its ministries and activities at every level. This is a major thing, a major thing done by a major black Pentecostal institution. And not so much about its blackness, but about its Pentecostal essence and yes. power. Yes. And so we're ready to take it to the world. This book is a great start. Wonderful, thank you so much, um, Bishop Paul. Uh, Dr. Johnson. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Williams. To um, add to what has been adequately and beautifully uh, said by the other panelists, I would say that for me, what's the game changer about this is, well, maybe it anchors on a couple of things. Number one, except we change the constitution of the church, we know that it is always within the power and only within the power of the jurisdictional prelate to determine who ultimately gets ordained in a jurisdiction mm -hmm. and who ultimately gets licensed. Of course, that's run through the uh, women's department and falls under the purview of the supervisor. As long as that's who we are constitutionally and organizationally, all that we can do on top of that then is to provide materials that would help bishops and supervisors and the people who work under them down to the local pastors who ultimately discerns who's ready to move on in ministry both as males and females all we can do then is provide them with a tool this is a game changer because it is the only tool. Now, now again, until we change the constitution, no one can mandate what tool the bishop uses. So, the, the, which kind of makes the debate even not a debate because at the end of the day, the bishop has a choice. The supervisor has a choice of what materials to use as long as we are who we are as far as our polity. So all we can do here then is make a strong case by the comprehensive nature of what's discussed. For example, we always hear that, well, um, we cannot change the doctrine. What does that mean? Within what context do you even have that discussion? How do you, how do you even create a framework to understand what's in our articles of religion, which are to us so sacred, so sacrosanct? For some of us, you can't change it. Well, how do you even understand it? Or, or what are just some basis for understanding what is it, what's in it, what it's saying, what it's not saying, uh, and, and allow you to teach and lead people so that they can be 
um, informed and deepen their faith as well as being able to defend it intelligently and, and rightly. So I think it's a game changer because it provides a framework within which to understand our doctrine and our history and some very practical uh, things in evangelism, preaching, spiritual growth, and et cetera, that will help a person uh, perfect his or her ministry over time. It's a tool, a useful tool, a helpful tool for a lifelong of growth and maturation in ministry. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. What a wonderful um, uh, time we're having today as we hear about the different fa facets of this um, important text. Um, before we end our time together, I just wanted to see if there, if either of you had uh, uh, a desire to engage someone about something that they said. I heard Doc Dr. Johnson say that it is a tool. And I think that's very, that's, it says we're giving more power. You know, we have the, the same knowledge is power, then ignorance is weakness. What we're doing is this, this document is a tool to have more powerful impact in ministry, to witness better, just to do the Great Commission. This is power even better, a tool to do it even better. I'd like to say something in relationship to the place of theological education. I'm so glad for Dean Harold Bennett, who has devoted most of his academic life uh, at Mason Theological Seminary and in the Atlanta area, and then specifically to the Church of God in Christ. Uh, to me, he, he, he represents a, 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 a theologian instructor. And we, through this text, now have a far-reaching tool, again, that uh, people can pick up the best that we have to offer. When I think of the personalities such as Dr. Daniel, uh, uh, who, who have made contribution, and uh, 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 so many others, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Alonzo Johnson, thorough, thorough scholarship, uh, Dr. Israel, and, uh, and then we could just go on and on and on and talk about each of the scholars. Get a copy of the book. You will see that these individuals are thoroughly Church of God in Christ. And they speak to the issue plainly, sincerely, and, and, and with the broadest stroke, the broadest stroke, that is to say in deep, dark, great strokes, you can't miss it. We're saying it's so clear, it's clarion. And we believe in this church. We believe in the doctrine of this church. And we are now preparing the next generation from our legacy for future growth and development. I sincerely believe that's what this text is going to do. Thank you, Dr. Hall. I think at, at the core we talked about in uh, when the C.H. Mason Jurisdictional Institute had, I mean, when C.H. Mason Seminary had their anniversary, they dealt with the importance of teaching. And at heart, all of us are teachers. And this, this textbook, Will help us to do it better you know i've given so much time and, and dr bennett has given so much time to his to the seminary and all of us on here we just believe in learning mm -hmm. we believe in learning and teaching and so this is this i'm excited just like all of us because this is going to be a game changer i really believe it is i do think uh and bishop hall Basically, many of his words capture what I what I want to say, but I just think it's such a great tool that we that that the Lord has blessed us to produce, and it's it's homegrown. You all remember the acronym FUBU for us by us. Yeah, this uh -huh. is something that we have created, Kojic Kojic men and women who the Church of God in Christ helped to pay for, who the Church of God in Christ helped to educate. The Church of God in Christ bought our books, paid our tuition, you know, did all of that as we all, many of us went to school and and we're very thankful. And this is a chance for us to help the church see and get some kind of return on its investment. 
this product, I think, is going to. And, and Eric, I love you. Sorry, Dr. Williams. I love your, your, your comment about it being a game changer. Um, this is something that I do think is going to um, really help make us a better denomination and deliver better, better services to not just just to cogent people, but to the world. And I'm, I'm excited about what this document has the potential of of doing and adding to um, the whole process. If any bishop decides to use it in his um, ordination procedure, I'm, I'm convinced that that the bishop won't be disappointed. I would add that um, while well, we're living on at on this end of the pandemic that we've been in for the last two and a half years, and what America, what the world, and thus what the church in America, the church in the world has had to deal with, is the reality of the power of mediums. We are on what is it, Streamyard, mm -hmm. uh, Zoom. Right. Um, right. Periscope and all of the other mediums. Knowledge is so available. Knowledge is so readily available. And so is disinformation. So is disinformation. So I like to say it like this, teaching in a denominational school that is not denominational and uh, being cogent. If, you're, if your theology is carried around, and this is a male reference, in your hip pocket. <laughs> and, you know, so all of us get to carry it around in our own way, in our hip pocket. It becomes whatever we want it to be at the moment because that's how we carry it. That's how loose it is. And, you know, and I, I think what this document does, again, it doesn't make doctrine. It was not commissioned to do that. It simply provides framework. It helps you to understand things about who we are. I think as you wrestle with those things, in this day and time, the end product would be people serving in ministry who have a deeper and more profound sense of what's distinctive about us. And it will also help to kind of peel away other things that about us that, you know, you know, we may think is more sacred than they actually are and more of a reflection of of our culture than of of of, of the, the essence of biblical truth and so i think this helps us to get at a lot of levels to help us to have more integrity more focus as well as more um more lifelong learning for people who are going to be leading others uh in life and ministry thank you thank you so much well my brothers and sisters it was the late French poet and novelist, Victor Hugo, who once said that there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. It is clear to me that this text that we have spent the time uh, in engaging with, these ideas, um, that it's time and the time has come. And so, um, I have enjoyed uh, the conversation, and um, uh, we are at the end of the conversation, and I will uh, turn it over uh, to uh, Dean Bennett, uh, who is the host of this gathering, and he will um, give instruction on where and how to purchase this text. And I encourage you all uh, to, uh, to go to uh, the Kojic Bookstore um, all of the Kojic conventions and secure your copy and let it bless the church and as we bless the nations. Uh, Dean Bennett? Eric, I don't know. I can just, I just have to build on what you just said because you really captured it all. Our audience, anyone who desires to receive a copy of this text you can do, you can get it. And I would say, as Eric has just pointed out in, in a couple of ways or three ways, maybe um, one, but you, you, you can get, if you're in the tri-state area, if you're near Memphis, Tennessee, go right downtown on South Main Street to the Kojic bookstore, right down South Main, go right downtown and you can actually purchase a copy there in the store. You can call, I think the number is 901-525-4004, 901 525 
for a call, but you can go right to the bookstore and you can get you a copy. If in fact you are not in that tri-state area, you're not in Memphis, you're not near Shelby County, why don't you just simply uh, get it online? You can actually visit our bookstore online and, and there are people who are there prepared to receive you know, your order and we'll mail it out. We'll get it to you. You can order it online. Eric made this point also. You can get it at our at our conventions. And I'm I'm certain that there will be some available. You want to get yours as soon as you can. Right now the supply is limited and we're we want to go ahead and make sure you get included in the number. So at our conventions you can get one there. You can order one online or you can go right downtown Memphis, Tennessee, South Main Street and get you a copy. Listen, we love you. We care about you. You've been called by God for ministry. You've got to get this document. You too high profile, not to have one. You cold, you can, we love you. That's how you can get one. As we celebrate the coming together of the, both the production and now the release, the full release of the standardized ordination curriculum, for the churches of God in Christ everywhere, uh, we would be remiss if we did not take the opportunity to uh, give recognition to, respect to persons who are no longer here with us because they have gone on to the church triumphant to be with the Lord. But their service, their work, their labor, their assignment in the church helped to make this possible. We, be we began with the late presiding Bishop Gilbert Earl Patterson under whose leadership or during whose leadership, much of the energy and the effort uh, for this volume started going back to 2000. We remember also the late chairman of the General Assembly respectively, the Bishop J.O. Patterson Jr. of Memphis, Tennessee, and the Bishop James Hunt of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania who were significant in their roles as chairman of General Assembly and as presiding bishop to uh, keeping things in place, supporting the process that would allow for the production of this text. And also persons who were significant in writing chapters of the text as well as supporting it, we must remember beginning with uh, the person whose article is the lead uh, chapter in the volume, the late general board member, Bishop George Dallas McKinney of San Diego, uh, California. The Bishop William Watson Sr. of uh, Lubbock, Texas, who contributed an early article and made a very significant uh, contribution early on as a supporter and representative of the Board of Bishops on the committee, working along with Bishop Hall uh, to, be, to bring this to pass. So thank you uh, to these uh, two men. And likewise, the late Adjutant General, uh, Bishop Barnett Thorogood of uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia. I uh, played no small role in uh, uh, codifying the uh, protocol for the um, Church of God in Christ adjutancy, and his chapter uh, has been consistently present in each of the volumes here. I want to personally thank, of course, our presiding bishop, the, the Bishop J. Drew Sheard, members of the general board, I want to thank personally also the chairman of the General Assembly, Bishop Lemuel Thuston, also one of the great ladies of our church, Supervisor Barbara McCool Lewis, once a board member of our seminary who participated greatly in this endeavor as well. And all persons who ably supported and gave the opportunity for this great work to come forward. I'd be remiss if I did not call the name of Bishop Charles Edward Blake, who initiated with uh, uh, this particular group of writers, scholars, this effort. It's been a great work, a labor of love. And the final product is one that uh, you are going to be proud of as a church. So I personally give 10 thanks 
to those names that I have just called. And I hope and pray that you will get your copy today. God bless you and thank you.